Good evening, everybody. Welcome to CCAD. My name is Melanie Korn, and I'm the president here at the college. I want to just welcome you all this evening to this talk by famed uh, designer, uh, Dr. Patricia Moore. I have long been a fan of Patty Moore's work um, and the sort of her groundbreaking uh, work both as a design researcher, as someone who has crossed these boundaries of sort of performance art uh, and design research, as someone who truly believes and has demonstrated the power of design to make a social impact. Um, I'm really uh, proud and pleased to have her here at CCD. So thank you all for coming to this tonight. I just want to say a quick um, thank you to our sponsors. Um, all of the programming that we do here at CCAD is part of our uh, public visiting artist and scholars lecture series, all of which is free and open to the public, is made possible by our partners, the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Arts Council, the Skestos Endowment Fund for Visiting Artists and Lecturers, and CD1025. So I just want to uh, thank our sponsors for tonight's event. And just to give one uh, I think this is my last event introduction of the semester, so one more uh, reminder to come back to campus uh, next month. Uh, May 8th is Chroma, our big end of year student exhibition, uh, 140, the 140th uh, end of year student exhibition here at CCAD, if you can believe it. So please come back on Wednesday, May 8th, uh, and come back again on Friday, May 10th for the fashion show, uh, and help us celebrate everything going on at the end of the year. And while you are here tonight, don't forget to go out to Beeler Gallery and check out the fabulous uh, MFA thesis exhibition that's there right now. Um, Director of Graduate Study Rick Petrie's last MFA thesis exhibition before his retirement at the end of the spring. Um, so again, thank you all for coming. And with that, I will turn it over to Chair of the Masters of Design and Integrative Design, Merce Grayel, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thanks. for coming here. Today is our um, third and last event of uh, invited um, renowned artists and designers for the Master of Design. We, we work with uh, people solving problems in different ways and I think that uh, Patty is, a, is a, a phenomenal representative of how do you lead by design. And that's how actually I met her. I met her in a conference about leadership and, uh, and experience, and the, um, the first uh, act, the first uh, coming into play was, <laughs> she's laughing already, it was this video from, what, the 70s? About uh, elder 80s, 90s, or oh, 60s? Uh, or oh, the 60s about, it is raining men, hallelujah, and can you imagine in the screen all these men wearing spandex? Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought that's, that's so, so fun and smart. Um, I always thought that, that our best leaders are, are the ones that not only uh, give us guidance, but makes us laugh. So I think that Patty uh, has this uh, conversions. And before I um, leave here the, the stage to her, also, when you go to the Biller Gallery, we have the fabulous MDES thesis uh, posters outside the auditorium. If you want to see what our students, we are graduating our first cohort. I'm going to cry a lot when I leave. And yeah, so Patty, more, thank, thank you. I'm perched because I was struck by a car um, and so I have a new norm while I'm learning to walk again. Um, it, was, it was one of those episodes in your life that is transformative. I try to be positive. My glass is overflowing, always has been, and particularly if it's bubbles, I'm happier still. Um, but I had just arrived in New Zealand to give the, uh, the closing keynote for the UX conference, and I was crossing the street back to my hotel, and I saw the most hideous shade of blue car to my right. And my um, immediate reaction, besides critiquing it, was, um, as Professor Vogel at DAP in Cincinnati snarkily said, oh, Wonder Woman's powers failed, but I did reach out to the car as if I could stop it. And um, I didn't stop it, but evidently the dynamic of pushing the car spun me round, and I almost cleared. 
but unfortunately my right leg was crushed. Later in the ER, a very kind-hearted uh, young man made the interesting comment that I should not worry that they would use dead American cadaver bones to repair my leg. <laughs> And I remember looking at the faces of three New Zealand nurses who joined with me in that moment of how do we castrate him best? Um, <laughs> and when he saw the worms on our face, he realized maybe that wasn't the joke to make at the moment as I was lying there bleeding and not sure what the outcome was going to be. He was trying, of course, with humor, as I try to do, um, lessen the pain. So let me use that as an apology beforehand. I will desperately try not to be too political, although I did watch CNN this morning, so it's quite difficult. And um, I, I, in all transparency, I was conceived in Toronto, born in Buffalo. I'm the daughter of a steel worker and a PhD in mathematics, my mommy, who uh, left us recently. And so I know every time I feel a ping on my head, it's one of my parents scolding me. Um, but it is my great honor, and I was just reminded that it was here uh, in Columbus where what has defined my career actually began. 40 years ago, next month, on May 16th, I arrived in Columbus to attend a conference of architects who were trying to define what skilled nursing care should be. And uh, so here we are, 40 years on, and we still don't have it right. I came in character as an elder and I was ignored by the conferees until the second day when a very astute young man said, you know, yesterday there was this old lady here, why didn't we talk to her? And on cue, the host held up my empty wig and people in the room realized, oh dear, she probably is still here. The conference changed when I came forward and said it was me. I was still finishing my studies in gerontology at Columbia University at the time. And we reckoned with our prejudice, our dismissive nature, even as professionals, towards meeting the needs of the people we proclaim to care the most about. And we um, spoke at length about encouraging me to continue. So four years later, I came out of character temporarily, as I like to remind people now at 67 and I look in the mirror and I start to see her more and more each day. Um, but after four years and traveling to 116 cities in the United States and Canada, we concluded the research and the elder empathy experience was technically complete. Um, from Buffalo, I went down the road to Rochester for university. In fact, it was the only school I, I actually applied to. Um, I didn't realize that I needed parental help or money to get into college. I, I did it on merit. Um, had pretty good SAT scores, as I recall. But in my naivete and not having uh, helicopter parents, I applied to one school, just assuming you get into it. So I'm glad I did. But I was, in fact, um, accepted as a fine arts major. My plan was to be an artist at night and by day be a medical illustrator and pay my bills because that's always been one of my weak points. I worry about you know, paying my bills. Um, soon after arriving at RIT, uh, this is a product uh, mistake called Clairol Sunning. <laughs> we do not necessarily lead better lives with chemicals. I just share that openly. Um, soon after arriving, they announced that the medical illustration major was concluded, and I had to go back to Canada, to McGill, if I was going to be um, a medical illustrator, and I didn't want to live in Canada again. So um, I struggled now as a fine artist. What was I supposed to do next? And as things often happen, the serendipity of a professor who'd been watching me unbeknownst to me, nothing creepy, not a Biden kind of thing, um, said, do you know what industrial, thank you, you, do you know what industrial design is? And then plopped a pile of journals on the table as I was working in clay one evening where I wasn't supposed to be in a studio that I had got the janitor to give me the key with cookies. Um, 
these are all coping mechanisms, ladies, and I'll get back to the Me Too moment that San Francisco has just alluded to. Um, I told him I didn't know what industrial design was. He giggled and said, nobody does, it's no worries. Have a look. And if you're interested in the major, come see me. And I was camped in his office Monday morning, and I changed my major. And I discovered design. I um, was one of six students in the first graduating class at the Rochester Institute of Technology and Industrial Design. I took a, a secondary major in graphic communication design, just in case, because I like to pay my bills. Um, but my, my art changed, and significantly. Now, for the students, I want to share with you right now, when we do a project, I often hand illustrate, no CAD, um, something for the client, and it always ends up framed and in the CEO's office. It, it, there's a resurgence in the glory of hand-drawn pieces, and so I highly encourage you to keep developing your sketching skills as you develop these wonderful illustrations, which I think are magical and wonderful, but they, there's nothing like um, looking at um, an illustration. I'm seeing a really hot screen. I don't know if it's this lighting, but it looks much better on my computer, so I'm sorry, it's a little washed out there. Well, in my junior year, I was called to the dean's office, and there were a group of men in suits, and I had been very active politically, so I really wondered why the FBI was there. And um, I thought, here we go again, my father's gonna kill me. They bailed me out so many times. There was always something, you know, marching with Martin Luther King, the ERA, the Vietnam War, I was busy. Um, but these men were from an office in New York. They were representatives of Raymond Lowy. And Lowy was in negotiations uh, with the Nixon administration for a Soviet detente agreement by design. And so I was told that if I continued to do well, my grades were good, um, I would be going to New York, if I chose to do so, to work on this project. My father um, died five years ago and never heard, at least from me, that I worked for the commies. It would have killed him. Again, he was a steel worker. Um, so I think he would have put me away. But um, I'm so happy. I still can't really tell a lot of the detail of the project, but I'm so happy to have been privileged to be part of that diplomatic effort to change a nation's view and attitude, not just about the United States, but about how we manage in a world where yes, we can have munitions, but should we? As a conflicted pacifist, I've never understood beyond protecting our sovereignty, how it is we can expect that war will give peace, that by subjecting ourselves to pain and vanquishing somebody that we have a potential for equality. So I am, as I say, very conflicted. I was relieved when I first spoke to Mr. Lowy about this and he said he too had always argued never to design for two arenas. The first was war. So he never worked on any form of munition and I have not as well. However, I do work with the wounded warriors and I'll tell you a bit about that next. Um, the other one that he never worked on was death. And I'll quote him badly, but he said, it's so boring. <laughs> and that was, that was his brilliance. You know, this is the man who said the best design was the egg. So it was um, a remarkable transition from being a student going to New York, and as my grandfather referred to as Sodom and Gomorrah, to um, work as the only female uh, industrial designer for Raymond Lowy's New York office and the Soviet detente agreement. Um, it was a very interesting time. We were still in the midst of the Mad Men era. It was um, not the nicest time for me, but in my indoctrination with Mr. Lowy, I sat in his office with the gentleman that you see in, in the uh, dark jacket here, Dave Butler, who sadly died at 42 of liver cancer, very sad. Um, he was instrumental on the design of uh, habitability for the first space station, Skylab. And then I got to do the post-occupancy study for NASA with that project later. Um, Dave sat with me as Mr. Lowy explained that I was in a hostile environment, 
and that there was nothing he could do about it. That part of my hiring was the fact that they thought I had the right personality to handle it. They highly recommended I not use any form of violence, but other than that, I had carte blanche to do as I saw fit for the conversion of a very hostile work environment where I was told to my face in many, many vulgar ways that I was taking a man's job and we didn't need no stinking rods in design. Fast forward, I'm so delighted as I travel the world now to see not only the presence of both genders, but the equity of both genders. The next battle, of course, is still fighting for pay equity for both genders. That said, we'll get back to the ERA maybe later. <laughs> So here I'm at, you know, that was as close to John Hamm as we had. He was a lovely fellow, I really adored him. Um, his wife, um, also deceased now, was a journalist and they believed in raising their children as their friends, not as their parents, and so he had two little girls and when they would call late at night to say goodnight to daddy because we were working outrageous schedule, you'd hear a little girl's voice say, is Dave there? <laughs> I remember the first time I uh, Dave is a little girl, and he just turned red. That's my daughter. My <laughs> wife believes they should call me Dave. <laughs> it was really precious. Darling, darling. So Dave was, um, as a Navy gentleman, was very anxious about some of the treatment um, I underwent. And, and the, the best way I could uh, demonstrate this for you tonight quickly, because I can't do the presentation I did in San Francisco, which was more at the height of the Me Too movement and a recognition that we did have some issues uh, revolving around gender in the workplace. I showed a litany of print advertising from the 1900s. And one of the images I showed was this. So ladies, we wondered how the hell we got to where we are, when in fact, this is how the girls were portrayed and the secretaries were the girls, and we were about coffee and, and being pretty, and we were very much that blonde character from Mad Men. If you need to look that up, I'll let you do that later. But when I look back at advertising and product positioning like this, I, you know, I can't say I'm proud to be an American, but I'm just really proud I survived. <laughs> so here we are, nearly five years a designer, five years, five decades a designer, and we still, of course, are dealing with the issue of equity. Um, I would rather laugh than cry, so I'm always looking for ways to convert thinking amongst people who just don't see an issue or a problem or the necessity for change. And I'm a big fan of pop culture, and especially movies that nobody has seen. <laughs> this is Rosemary Clooney, who was in Kentucky, and, and she's George's auntie. Um, in fact, he lived in her closet, as he describes it, and she said, no, it wasn't a closet. She li he lived with uh, her when he was a struggling actor. Uh, this is a scene from White Christmas. And if you have not seen this film, please, 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 this is what God invented Netflix for. <laughs> so see this movie, and it is absolutely sweet. Right now, uh, Vera something or other is singing with Rosemary Clooney a song called Sisters. And the lyric goes something like, sisters, sisters, she wore the dress and I stayed home. And so they're, you know, they're struggling and they had just the one evening dress and so they were taking turns as to who could go on a date. So when the news of a few weeks ago hit, I thought, really? <laughs> we're still at that point where we send two astronauts into space and they only have one dress? You've got to be freaking kidding me. I swear this is some kind of conspiracy to finally put me away. And so here we are. And you have to wonder, is this the right life, life safety decision? What if all the astronauts had to leave the security of the space station and wait hopefully to be rescued if there's some catastrophic failure and we don't have the right sizing for spacesuits for all the participants? Outrageous. Absolutely outrageous. So I apologize if I press buttons, but that's my job and it's also my joy. <laughs> um, accessibility became um, key in my career early on. 
In meeting after meeting at Lowy, I would meekly raise my hand to add, well, what if, what if, what if? And it was always about, what if we expanded our design vision and included people that were not considered primary consumers, primary customers? And they typically were our elders, uh, people with arthritis, people who walked with wheels, um, saw with their fingertips, listened with their eyes. And I would get these groans and moans from my colleagues, um, not yet friends, saying we don't design for those people. And I really was aghast at that because I was raised with my grandparents. And I never saw my grandparents as those people, but I witnessed their inability as they aged in place and could no longer do the simplest tasks of everyday living. And I knew they weren't broken. The products that confined them, the products that confounded them, were at issue. And that meant it was a matter for design. When my parents passed, I received some photo albums that I actually hadn't seen before. And one of the images was this. And it dawned on me, I have come to my attitude about equity and design from a very early age. Because clearly, I'm looking at one of my parents saying, you expect me to deal with this? How am I supposed to climb these stairs? And I'm not pleased. And I have a face full of worms. But I am absolutely precious. <laughs> so accessibility. It's certainly a big piece of our puzzle, but it's not all of our puzzle. I was promised by Star Trek that Scotty would be beaming me up, and yet here again I'm schlepping around airports dealing with an industry that's gone absolutely mad. As a Boeing designer, I am furious with the company, and I'm wondering how is it we haven't seen more progress in transport. But what really bothers me at the end of the day is Uhura had to wear a cocktail waitress uniform while everyone else got to have pants on. And yet this poor gal did her job and then some. Give the girl a pair of slacks. The other side of my coin beyond accessibility is inclusivity in all things. And so, when I reckon with the early years dismissal of my insistence that we look at people managing the changes of time, the effects of injury, anomalies of birth, chronic illness, that they deserve and need our design, innovation, creativity, and support as much, if, if not more, than others. And that we can't take pride in any technology if, in fact, it doesn't equally address the needs of people who cannot manage these tasks of everyday living. As I witnessed as a very little girl when I saw the day my grandmother could no longer open the refrigerator door. It was the last time she cooked a meal, and within a year she was dead. And I think it was of a broken heart because she took such pride and making our family meals. So this is probably where the empathy comes from. It made no sense to me then, it doesn't make any sense to me now, that we are not encouraged by the opportunity for equity by design. And so, at 26 years of age, actually I was 32 here, but it was the only photo I had. Plus, the People magazine photographer took it and she gave me cheekbones, and I really like this picture. <laughs> it's vain, I know, I have to go to confession, I understand that. <clears throat> but it was interesting, when you take your body that was relatively able at that time and prosthetically alter it, you know, with the first age suit, if you will, to become another person, it was very interesting for me as for my own emotional transition into this characterization. But what was so fascinating was how immediately people saw me as a completely different thing. Not a person, but a thing. Looking through me, past me, bumping into me on the sidewalk, not caring if they almost knocked me over. As I tried my best to go through a normal day as a citizen, as a consumer, changed by time, 
And so I wasn't acting, I was wearing full body prosthetics that didn't allow me to run or you know, walk easily, I couldn't see well, I couldn't hear well. All of my innate ability had been altered. And in the characterization, looking at the socialization, we tried different costuming to convey certain income levels. And this actually is my father's mother, Margaret Mary Moore. This is her clothing. I had a new pocketbook and shoes. Um, and it was interesting, as I put on this costume, I could really understand method actors. You, you really do become this person. You could understand Al Pacino a bit better. You know, you just, you understood what was happening. And it was very hard for me, at the end of the day, to come out of character. To the point at the end of the four years, I didn't. And I don't think I had a, a complete break, but I, I was really altered and damaged psychologically by the experience and the things that happened. Most days were basic, uh, not too traumatic, but the trauma on the bad days was extreme. I was um, mugged twice, the second time I was beaten by a gang. And I was beaten to the point where later when I married and tried to start a family, we found that pelvic injuries were so severe that I couldn't carry a child. So I warned students, I'm the mother you didn't know you had. I couldn't have my own children, but you're my babies now. And I will do my duty and, and diligently, hopefully pass the torch to you and support you because I have nothing but faith in the future because of your passion and compassion. And today I met with so many of you and I am so energized by what I've heard from you what I saw in your hearts and your souls, and I'm just very, very hopeful for tomorrow. People would see me and uh, call out cruel things, tell me to get out of the way, you'll bag. I could never cross the street in time of the light change. It wasn't long enough. Um, twice when I was in the character of a bag lady sitting in uh, a doorway somewhere, men came up to me and spit in my face. It was uh, painful to toilet in a public place, in a bush, because the restaurant pushed you away and wouldn't let you in when you needed the sanctity of a public toilet. And yet, I emerged from this experience forever changed because it gave me so much information about not just what we could do by design, but what we should do by design. And so my central point has always been designing for life's quality. Whether you live in a grand home or a very modest home, a UU is equal. We're all snowflakes, no two of us alike, but in that uniqueness, we're the same. And if we could somehow get to that point of equity, maybe we could stand a chance. So I have to believe that when we address lifestyle and quality of life by design, everyone will have exactly what they need. Whether it's the beginning of life or the end of life, we need the dignity of design. And some issues present very difficult challenges, but they are still elements for design. I've been pretty persnickety about language over the years, and this is a word I only use when talking about golfers or uh, horses and races. I don't believe any of us is handicapped. I believe all of us have some level of ability. And it's my job by design to accentuate that, to compensate, to support. I couldn't tell to this child that there was anything wrong with him. By design, we're making everything in this world right again. And that's exactly what our innovation and creativity should be about. I also don't use the word disability for that very reason. 
And I try really hard to get people to focus in a proactive way on that ability level that we're addressing in the moment. And let it be as broad as possible so that all people's needs, wishes, and dreams are met. In working with a population where the vulgarity of war has forever changed their body and therefore their capacity, it's probably been some of the most difficult challenges I've faced, but I must say it is also the most meaningful work. It's hard coming to the bedside of a wonderful young man like this and telling him with a straight face and without tears in my eyes that you better get up, soldier, expletive, expletive, expletive. I was told by a wonderful doctor at Walter Reed, if you're not swearing at them like their staff sergeant, they're gonna think something's wrong. You, they don't need a mommy, they don't need a girlfriend or a wife or a big sister. They need a deranged sergeant telling them to get up because it's time for physical therapy because they need to rebuild their lives. And that's what we do by design. So even with the greatest of challenges, today it's much easier than it was in past generations. You'll note two pieces of technology on his bed. These technologies are addressing everything from their psychological needs, their social needs, job finding, buying a home, match.com. It really is a, a componentry that's more holistic and helping in ways we didn't have before the technology. And the focus, of course, is usability, ultimately in all things. Mr. Lowy always told me I would design trains. I'm not a big car person. I've only owned one car in my whole life. Um, I like to giggle about there are people for that, so I like having a driver, but I don't like to drive. Um, and now I can't drive, so I have to have a driver. But when I was invited to do a train in Phoenix, it was the light rail. And so I said yes to that, but the caveat was I wanted a hierarchy that addressed the needs of the people who needed that transportation the most as the primary consumers. And gratefully, the five mayors, because there's you know the cities of Tempe and Mesa and Chandler, and so it's, it's quite like New York City. It has different little cities around it. They, they said, yes, okay, that's fine. So we had citizen coalitions, we had workshops. We, we worked really hard to make sure that Noah's Ark had everybody on board. To my great surprise, I began getting death threats and needed police protection because in the interesting state of Arizona at the time, and sadly inclusive of Senator McCain who came around, I was disrupting a culture and I should just get my little feminist butt back to New York City that they didn't need no stinking mass transit in Phoenix. And sadly, the council has just denied three other routings of the light rail in favor of more highway expansion. And sometimes I wonder why I get out of bed, but I hear Mr. Lowy's voice in my head saying, do the train, do the train, and so we carry on. But I can tell you we're very thrilled with the result because it is the most accessible system in the United States today because it was designed by and with people, not for people. And that's a very important component. Knowing that people are getting jobs, going to work, able to manage their personal lives, their family lives, their quality of life by design because they can get from one place to another. And that has been essentially the cornerstone of all my work. People are often surprised, since I do hold a degree in, in gerontology, to learn that, I like to say, age has nothing to do with what we design. Now certainly there are um, some elements that there's age-specific designs, but as little boys in the great state of Texas will often prove, as they steal the pickup truck, one kid working the pedals and the other working the steering wheel, even preschoolers can drive. And you see this on the news periodically and you're always amazed no one gets killed and the state troopers pull over the truck and they're like, you are a big troll boy. <laughs> and it's just, how does this happen? So it's not age, these kids had the ability, they figured it out, you know, and that's, that's interesting to me. But with age, we do have some considerations until we develop the set of skills that we re require to manage our lives 
we are at the beck and call of others. We have need of someone to do our shopping and we need someone to take us about and to make our meals. I learned to walk with the help of my puppy King, who was 110 pounds of boxer. Um, Mommy used to put me in the front yard and never worried about me being kidnapped because of King. But she didn't know that I had learned to walk because of King. So this beautiful dog went to its deathbed with these two bald spots on its hindquarters because my little chubby fingers were hanging on tightly. But I was supported by my King. And we all have Kings in our lives in many, many levels and layers at different times, at different points. We need a support complement and often, ultimately, that's going to be designed. My grandfather lived with us, and he was my king. I adored him. He was my first boyfriend, my favorite boyfriend. He was the corner of my delight. He was so important to me. When he passed at 95, I thought my heart would never mend. I just talked to him all day in a different way now. My grandfather only went to school to the fourth grade. He had four children, all girls, and they were all postgraduates. He walked to the steel mills and worked there as a laborer. He never drove a car. He made bathtub gin, and he saved his house through the Great Depression. He was my champion, and he was my mentor in how you just turn lemons into lemonade. He was a really great guy. And this is his dog, Mr. Magoo the meanest beast on the earth. This dog knew that his role in life was to protect my grandfather, because at this point, as a result of his injuries in World War I, he couldn't walk, he could barely move, and so he would take his position in his chair, this is our cottage in Canada, and this dog would watch him. And anyone got too close, they heard about it. You'd take your finger off. I saw a change in my grandfather, just as I did with my grandmother, when she could no longer cook the family meals. When Mr. Magoo got his wings, Grandpa really wasn't the same. And I, I'm driven by design with the recognition that if you are heartbroken, if your spirit is deadened by the fact that you cannot manage the built environment in which you live, that's everyone's business by design. It means we have to keep reckoning with the goal of providing ability in all things. One of his last interviews, Professor Hawking was asked, what does the world need to survive? And he answered, empathy. Empathy is what we must magnify if we're going to survive. And I have to admit, I think he's quite right. Because it's with empathy, we can focus on providing capacity. And when we focus on what we can do instead of what we can't do, that's where the real magic begins. I'm from Buffalo. We have to like the bills. Um, it's, it's interesting when you hear Jim Kelly give a motivational speech, he was the quarterback of the Bills who brought the Bills to four consecutive Super Bowls and lost every one. And when he tells the crowd, the Bills hold a record nobody will ever break, and he gets to that point where he says, we lost every time, the crowd goes wild, everybody's so proud about being a bridesmaid and never a bride. And I think that that's the spirit with which I was raised. So when I saw the Seattle Seahawks and the fact that they recognized there was real merit to hiring this kid to play pro ball along with his twin brother, even though he had lost a hand as a child, I thought this is what it's all about. And he's a good player evidently. I don't know enough to really say, but the real joy came a few months ago when he was at an event and met this little boy who was born without one arm. And just seeing that video, get your Kleenex ready, it's, it's absolutely amazing. It just, it's like church. You just walk away enriched by the experience of seeing this little guy suddenly realize, oh, 
he looks like me. There's this moment of recognition because he's a little shy. You know, maybe he'd never seen a man like this before and his parents are urging him to go talk to the football player. And when this magic happened, this is why I get up every morning. I spent the last 10 years uh, working on a project under the Obama administration um, in China, looking at the impact of the one-child policy. Now there is a meeting you know didn't have any broads. <laughs> because there is no way if there were women in this meeting they would have said, I know what a good idea is, we only have one kid, that's gonna work. And let's make it a boy baby. Because in the villages, sadly, what we had was a killing of the girl children. Because ideally you wanted a son. So now you have all these Chinese guys who are having to go to other countries to find a bride, and so that didn't work well, did it? But on a serious note, what's really bad is global aging certainly is the tsunami in our midst, and it is a labor issue, if nothing else. And we do not have enough children in China to properly care for the parents and grandparents, and even great-grandparents that exist. I can't say we came up with playbook or even a plan for the future. But what we did do was to quantify and hopefully actualize um, a plan for the near future on how care is going to be delivered. This mother's in her 90s and she's caring for a son who has never walked and you know when she deceases this guy's in trouble. Just as he would be here. I spent a year in bed recovering, and I couldn't hire a nurse. It had nothing to do with money. There were no nurses to be hired. So we have a labor issue, and it's come to us very quickly. We are not ready for the care agenda of elders globally. If we don't have appropriate care, it's because we don't have choice. And we can't manage our lives without choice. It's essential. You don't want the same dinner night after night after night. But in Kyoto, at a Universal Design Congress several years ago, my dear friend and pseudo brother Roger Coleman was the first guy to wave his hand hysterically when the Toyota rep said, who wants to be first to try this new personal transportation device? <laughs> Roger boarded had no idea how the thing worked and drove it right into the wall, toppled over, and he came up smiling. He was so delighted. What is with you guys? <laughs> he was just like thrilled with this. It has not made it to the market, nor should it. It was a little scary. I kept seeing Sigourney Weaver, you know, going after the ambience or something. It just didn't have the right vibe for me. Um, but it was fascinating, and he enjoyed the ride, evidently. But if you're going to enjoy your ride, Beyond choice, you have to have control. And so this then becomes the real challenge for design. I was so delighted recently to see the high school team, the robotic team, that took on the challenge of building a transportation device for this little guy. He's two and he can't ambulate independently. So they came up with this as part of a personal challenge for a little boy in their community. And when interviewed, one of the students, a young lady, said this was better than winning any robotics team award. Just seeing him be able to move about his world with such joy and happiness. And you knew the subtext was, and that's what design is for. This is not just our job, this is our joy. We get to deliver autonomy. And without that, there isn't much reason to live. I've been working on over 300 personal assistant robotic projects in Japan. And I have to share with you, I am not happy with any of the outcomes. I don't want this thing helping me to toilet or bathe. It's just, it's not ringing any of my bells. But I know exactly what I do want. My robot has to be Captain Jack. <laughs> I am certain it is the perfect fit for me. <laughs> and I think about it all the time. But we're running out of time. 
I'm 67 this year, people, so get busy. Because if I don't get Johnny Depp as Captain Jack, there's going to be hell to pay. <laughs> Our focus, again, is on the lifespan. And as I said, I have such high hopes because of the quality of the intellect and caring I see with students all over the world today. But recently I heard the story of this little girl whose mother is a visiting nurse and goes around to a number of, of long-term care centers. And she just loved visiting with her mother as she did her work just talking to these adopted grandmothers and grandfathers. And she just found them so fascinating. She adored it. I think um, the other piece was she didn't have any living grandparents. So this, this really was something I understood and resonated with me when I, when I heard about it. So little Ruby one day realized she could um, do something interesting if she started asking all the residents, if I could grant you three wishes, what would they be? And when she was interviewed on, on CBS Sunday Morning, which was the piece I saw, she said, I expected they would say things like they wanted to go to Europe, or you know, they wanted a home of their own, or they, they wanted you know, extraordinary things. And then they started telling me, well, I'd like a pair of socks. I'd like a pair of shoes or a sweater. She said they were asking for really easy things. And you could see this little child was befuddled by the fact that they weren't getting these basic things of life. And then she said, but the really odd one is they all want Vienna sausages. <laughs> and I, I had to look it up because I thought, is that like spam? But I don't know if it was just that part of the country, there's like a Vienna sausage urge, you know. For me, that wouldn't do. I'd rather have a corn dog. But, you know, to each their own. And so, she began raising money, and she does have a GoFundMe, so please look her up. It's Ruby's Residence. And do as I did, send this kid some money, and she has raised a lot of money, and so she's able to buy all the wishes, the three wishes on these lists for these grandparents that she adores, and I think this is what gives you hope for tomorrow. So age. We're talking about people living to be 100. We're talking about people over the age of 100. And that's a nice number, but I'll tell you, I don't really care to live to be 100 if I don't have the dignity that comes with design. I have no children. I have a very small family. I look forward to a future where essentially I'll be surrounded by strangers and hopefully they'll be good-hearted and caring and kind. But I'm not sure I want to live necessarily a long, long life if, in fact, I don't have quality of life. And when I was brought to Hong Kong to look at the homeless situation there, roughly 10,000 people homeless in Hong Kong and being housed in canine cages. This was shocking to me in a land of such plenty to realize that the government was struggling with this as an issue. That seemed like such an easy fix, but of course, as it is in so many cities, the nature of homelessness is such that far too many of us don't have a safe nest in which to live. And taking on the challenge, it's still a very small footprint. It's more like staff cabins on a cruise ship, just elevating the housing option with the dignity of design. You've probably heard the phrase of aging in place, which was started by interior design and is clearly an agenda whose time has come. It means that essentially we just want to live where we choose to live. The last thing you want is to be displaced and put into a skilled care setting, something that might mimic a home but is not your home. And so more and more, I think the agenda of today for design is recognizing our homes are becoming little hospitals, as it should be, if it maintains and allows our independence and autonomy. We're gonna need a lot of tools, we're gonna need furnishings, we're gonna need services and technologies, and I think that's the kind of challenge that design was made for. 
Maybe the problem in the Congress today and all over the world, because we haven't found any existing, so correct me if I don't know of one, is the fact that we don't have leadership that are designers, engineers, architects. We have a lot of lawyers and ex-businessmen. And once we had doctors in our Congress, we got the Affordable Care Act. So if you don't have everyone on the ark, not everyone is invited to the party. If someone's voice is absent, it's no wonder that we have the challenges of today. Wherever we look in the world and we find poverty, wherever we look and we find the inequity of a financial economy that says some of us are haves and some of us are have-nots, the killing of the middle class in our own great nation due to a lack of good jobs the diversity that's required for us to survive and thrive. And what if the displacement is the result of war or the savagery of the brutality of some people seeing you, unfortunately, as an object? How can we, by design, take on global challenges today that only because of the luck of our birth aren't primary in our daily lives. And what happens when material science fails, like the Grenfell fire, which was the cladding on the building that incinerated these tenants? Or the ravages of nature, typhoons, cyclones, tsunamis, forever changing and eradicating ways of lives. And not just humanoid, what about all the creatures of this great world of ours? How do we address all of these things? How do we embrace all the needs as equal, all the snowflakes? We do it by design. We're entering a happy and holy season, Easter and Passover, where we are meant to rejoice and I think it gives us all now the opportunity to look very holistically and systemically and globally to the opportunities at hand. I just came back from Alabama working with the uh, Arts Alliance there. And I was in Birmingham and nearby were two churches, the First Baptist Church and the First uh, Presbyterian Church. Sadly, no more from the recent tornado. And I think of the Easter services that these good people will be having this year. And as we saw earlier this week, I think about the change of cultural iconic, no religiosity even necessary, but iconic structures that define so much of our memory and romanticism about what we build and what then is lost, and how do we resurrect and rebuild. Because all of us have the same expectations. In this life, we just want our wishes and our wants and our needs and our dreams to be addressed and to be met, and that's a matter of design. It is the humanism of our time. When I am honored, as I was with this invitation, I always take the honoraria, and at the end of the year we add them all up, and then I double it, and I give it to a charity. And I wanted to share with you that this visit is helping to support the works of Shriner Hospitals for Children. 30 years ago, I met this little girl in Philadelphia, where we were installing a children's rehab environment called Rehab 123, because after all, a child's work is play. And so all the componentry that helps with speech therapy and occupational therapy, physical therapy, all this is done in this very holistic microcosm of everyday living and fun that takes away the pain of recovery for these children. And the men um, from my factory had been there all week and they were telling this sweet little girl who watched them every morning, she would get dressed and the nurses would allow her to stand in the doorway and watch as they were building this Disneyland that was going to be hers. 
And they were telling her, you know, our boss is coming. And she was really interested in all the minutia. And she said, oh, what's your boss's name? And they said, Patty. She said, oh, your boss can't be Patty. That, that's a girl. And they said, no, our boss is a girl. Bosses aren't girls. And they said, this boss is a girl. So she couldn't wait till the day I was arriving. And she wanted to meet a boss who was a girl. Now she's a physical therapist. She's regained the capacity to walk and she works at Shriners and she takes care of little ones like herself. And so what you're helping to support is another one of these environments that incorporates all the things that edify and amuse a child and more so their siblings and their friends and their families because now you see children who are made able where ultimately parents were fearful that their child would do without and never be at that level of capacity. So I thank you so very much for that. And I'm gonna leave you with the words of my grandfather. You know, we used to come home from school with an F on a math test, and remember mommy was a math teacher. It was a, you know, problem. And you'd go immediately to grandpa because he was never judgmental. And he used to give us the kind of grandpa hug that only grandpas know how to do. And you'd sit on his lap and he'd wipe away your tears. And every, every aspect of pain, he would just make it better. And he had a favorite little poem that I'd like to share with you. He used to remind us in these moments of strife and pain that in this life you have to do more than just look. Try to see. And if you can, do more than simply hear, listen. Go beyond just touching and feel something. And do more than simply talk, try to say something. But above all else in this life, remember, you weren't put here just to exist. You're here to make a difference. That difference is design. Thank you so much, God bless you. Happy holidays. Thank you so much for your attention. taking the application and, and they were like well let me help you fill that out and I was like okay so I'm being playful and we're playing with each other having fun and um, he's writing hair beautiful brown eyes gorgeous brown and then he said wait and I said okay he said no what's your weight and I said oh yes <laughs> so I had a driver's license with a weight that was nowhere near my weight so was I. <laughs> a little white lie is not going to kill you. It just means you have to go to confession. So that was the stall. Yes, sir. First, thank you for coming up. Uh, touched on some points that are good for us to go into, but I'm curious of uh, things that you wish you had done that, that you would use now. Things that I could use now personally as, as a person that I wish I had designed, is that what you said? I have a, a roaring AV something going on back here. Is that what you said? I guess my question is, what would you do that you didn't do if at this age in your past? Like, what, what, what would you do? At which age? This age or your age? <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I just want to make sure I get this right. That's it. So knowing what you know now. Yeah, what would I change? Are, what, would you, what would you maybe have wished you could have designed Exactly. Well, there's that Johnny Depp thing that's really, <laughs> I can't make that any clearer <laughs> because I know there's a snowball's chance in hell that that's how I'm going to be bathed, okay? But it is, in fact, what gets me up in the morning. Um, I was criticized, Liz might find this interesting, I was criticized in my 30s, I think, about being too crazed about all this, you know, I guess when I would speak at conferences and I was
trying to share, we gotta hurry people, we gotta hurry, this clock is ticking. I, you know, I saw the sand in the hourglass and I knew it was not good. And I heard someone at a, an industrial designers conference say, they didn't realize I was within earshot, you know, Patty's gotta calm down. And I, I think I'd have to admit now, I, I wish I had been even more boisterous. Um, when I hit 60, I, I gave myself um, permission <laughs> to really say what was on my mind even more so, because I realized people are letting me get away with murder now, it's so much fun. And I, I warn people, I'm somewhere between Judge Judy and the Dowager from Downton Abbey, <laughs> so don't irritate me. Um, but I think that might be the role of sages in our midst. You know, we really should be listening to Grandma and Grandpa more. You know, when they go off and they're telling you the same story they've always told you, it's because you haven't heard the message, so maybe it's time for us to take that more to heart. I think some of the best programming that I've seen recently is, in fact, the magic of putting elders and younger people together. You know, utilizing two forgotten age groups in the continuum of care and design. That's, that's one of the most remarkable things. We did a project in Seattle years ago where there was a children's daycare center and an adult daycare center. And they were both struggling for funding and we came in and said, why, why don't we combine them? And you see a total rebirth of purpose when you put a little child of two or three on the lap of a grandmother or grandfather. Now they're doing arts and crafts with purpose. You know, they don't want to make a clay ashtray, you know. They're 85, give them a break. They want a drink and some canasta. But you know, we're not allowed to do that. That's illegal. But to have these little ones now become the grandchildren that they craved and, and desired, and the little guys go home with their joy and say, look at what Grandma Patty helped me make today. That reckoned with the needs and desires of both communities, and it was magical. And so we do see a lot of that. So I think I would, if I had changed anything, I was so busy with product and environment design in the first like, three decades of my career, I wish I had fought harder for social design, besides getting arrested. <laughs> you know, so, um, but I don't know that we were ready to hear about it then. And uh, so maybe now the time is actually right. Again, I, I work with emerging Gen Z and the youngest of millennials now, and I see a completely different attitude, very compassionate, passionate attitude. And that's what really does give me hope. I can't say that enough. So I just hope I live long enough to help them and pass the baton. That's really what, what drives me today. Yes, sir. First of all, amazing talk. And Thank second you. of all, I'm finishing up the book, Never Leave Well Enough Alone. So yes. You can see we'll live out this great and lovely you know, pattern here. Mr. Lowy, as the father of, of uh, product design in the United States, really is beyond iconic. Um, he's a little guy. We deliberately wore flats so that we weren't taller than him. Um, his wife was taller than him, his second wife, his trophy wife. It was a very nasty divorce. Um, he had one child, a daughter, and she was my age. He never spoke to it, but I believe also in hiring me, he hired his daughter who was totally disinterested in design. I think Lawrence broke his heart in a lot of ways because she just really didn't care about her dad's work. Well, he named her Lawrence. Okay, we might start there. Um, he was very French. He spoke English beautifully, unless he was in the United States, and then his French accent was so thick you struggled to hear what he was saying. He was a feminist, but he was also um, of the genteel estate to the point where when he knew he was going to use rough language in a critique, he made me leave the room. <laughs> but I think it was also part of his grand plan for payback to the bad boys. You know, so I was allowed to delicately, you know, fragile flower that I am, leave the room and stand in the hall while he screamed obscenities and then I would be brought back into the meeting. He was a visionary beyond how the word is defined today, no, no doubt about it. I only wish he had lived in a time of the technology we have today. It would have been really remarkable to see 
what you know Dreyfus and Lowy and T could have accomplished now, but what they accomplished then is remarkable. That he was able to influence NASA so completely with the needs for design and habitability is remarkable, considering they were just as happy to send men up into space and treat them like monkeys. And it was Lowy who really changed that dynamic. Um, the only regret I probably have in life is when the New York office folded because the Soviet Union never paid their bill. London and Paris was still open and Mr. Lowy asked me to go to Paris. And I was married at the time. And I just was blinded by one-sided love. I should have left the bastard and gone to Paris, but I didn't do that, so I, <laughs> I had a reckoning later, but it was too late. <laughs> But then again, I wouldn't have done the empathic research. So, you know, everything does work out in the end. My favorite letter from Mr. Lowy, we had an extensive correspondence, which rivals the correspondence they had with Victor Papanek, who was a brilliant correspondent. It was so much fun. I, I, I pinched myself that I had friends like this, and they're still in my heart and head. Um, he sent me a letter uh, when I was coming out of character and there was a lot of media and all it said was stop being more famous than me <laughs> and I thought that was absolutely precious and so I really felt that that was the best you know exclamation of well done Patty that he could have given me that was the nicest thing yeah I miss him terribly um, he was he was really remarkable Yes. What were some of your results of your for your research of being in the shoes of an older person? Um, again, thanks to the media, and now that we have social media, which you have to manage much better than we're doing right now, I, I encourage all students to recognize the power of the media getting behind your message. So I had, you know, radio, TV, newspapers um, pushing my agenda. It was amazing, it was like a snowball going down the hill, it just kept getting bigger and bigger. So I started something that I didn't necessarily even control, but it resonated with communities everywhere. It wasn't just here in North America, it was everywhere. I was being asked to you know, come and talk about this, but the real defining element was the number of companies who had a wake up call as a result. Because they had never considered elders as a consumer component in their business plan. And beyond that, I think the one thing I've tried really hard to teach companies and industries overall is stop thinking you're selling to an age. Stop thinking you're selling to seniors or you know golden agers or Betty White. Because a lot of times you're not selling to the right person. I bought and I paid for a lot of the things that enriched my parents' life. So there's the primary user and the primary purchaser. And so if I've done one thing in changing the business arena, it's to get them to realize you're, you're selling to the wrong person because you're trying to message the end user. What you want to do is message the friends and the family that can make the purchase and assist the family. And that's really been, a, I think, a huge help in indoctrinating people with technologies that they didn't know that they could really use. Although I must tell you the most heartbreaking thing as a designer and as a daughter that I did with my mother was after my father's death, I ordered Lifeline for her. I was able to live with her for a couple of months as she transitioned. And she was hopeful of living on her own, but I knew her level of hearing was so low and she was so obstinate um, that I was concerned about her safety and so I insisted that she wear a lifeline. And as I was getting ready to leave for the airport, I put that stupid ugly string with a piece of hideous plastic around my mother's neck and I felt like I was tagging a cattle in a, you know, a yard where she was going to be butchered or something. It was the most horrible feeling as I watched my mother's eyes fill with tears. That wasn't design. So we still have a lot of work to do. Because you're not hanging one of those on me. If that's where I come to, 
and I'm going to go sit in the bottom of my pool with a bottle of Dom Perignon and a straw, <laughs> and I'm leaving. <laughs> so, yeah. And I, I really think that is the overall message from my experience, was people saw it as their experience. It got everyone thinking, ooh, what, what about when I'm 85? The one question I got from reporters time and time again, which I found so odd, was, why did you do that? Why would you do that to yourself? I said, because I just really needed to know what the heck was going on that we were so afraid to address the needs of our elders slash people of different levels of ability. Why weren't we more enamored with meeting their needs as equal? Why did we think of them as those people? Because remember, it was the 70s, and we, we were not embracing that agenda. I was on a lot of the, the think tank teams that put together the Americans with Disabilities Act. I lost the battle to call it the American Abilities Act. You know, and I kept saying, no, it's not the disability. Nobody cares a rat's ass about disabilities. We care about ability. No, it had to be named the Disabilities Act because people won't know what you're talking about. Um, earlier today, I was speaking with students that are working on continent care, and that was my first client. When I came out of character in 1982, I was hired by Kimberly Clark to introduce the first consumer product for continent care, and they insisted, I should say the ad agency did, they insisted that it be called incontinent care. <laughs> and I was like, no, it's continents, it's work. we want continent care. And I lost that battle. And you still see it in advertising today. <laughs> for some reason, we look at what's wrong with the picture instead of what's right with the picture, and we're not using more proactive positionings, which drives me absolutely nuts, but I choose my battles wisely, or I try. Um, so I, would, I think the, the outcomes really were fundamentally about awareness and then a recognition that there was a business opportunity and I have no shame in helping a company make money with doing the right thing. If companies aren't making a profit with what we do, they're not going to do it. So I take great pride in making companies very, very rich with good stuff. Using the word good, you have to remember that when Smart Design and I worked with Sam Farber and Betsy Farber to create OXO Good Grips, that made a lot of money. If Sam had any regrets, he sold the company too soon. Because it was so successful, all we were getting were calls saying, can you make us OXO Good Grips? And I was like, I don't know, do you want to be wrapped in Santa Cream? What are you asking, fool? You know, you don't say these things. These are the cartoon bubbles over your head and you can't say them out loud. But it was, that's how companies call, you know, could you make us OXO good grips? No. <laughs> we'll make you what you're supposed to be. Um, so yeah, I think we've had a reckoning. I think there's an awareness. And um, every once in a while, you know, I'll still see an ad or something that is just using the wrong nomenclature and the positioning is just off base. But you suck that up and you, you call them. And you get a new client and you fix it. But again, I can't be everywhere, and I am 67 this fall, so mm -hmm. I pass the baton. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I, I saw long hair, and I don't no, have my glasses okay. on. Okay. Nice hair, wish I had it. <laughs> I want to say that I really enjoyed the talk. Um, Thank you. I remember reading about you in textbooks when I was growing up, so like hearing you talk in person was just an amazing experience. Thank you. Um, so I'm a colorblind artist. Oh, there's a great guy I've got to introduce you to in New York. He's a cartoonist called Eric Mache. Have you ever seen his work? Uh, I think I've actually heard that name before. Yeah. Yeah, I, I he, colorblind yeah he's totally colorblind. Okay, like gray Black and white. Okay. Shades of gray. Wow. Yeah. So, he's brilliant. Yeah. I went to school with him at RIT. That's cool. Yeah. Um, so I, was, I want to say that uh, I want to think that really interested in is accessibility for colorblind people. Yes. Yeah. And I felt it might be important to ask you what advice you might have for someone like getting into that. Well, you know, with a lack of ability to see a full range of color, we have some serious life um, safety issues. So in public space, wayfinding and all sorts of things, to the embarrassment of it. What if we color-coded toilets just pink and blue? You might go into the wrong stall. That said, it points out the opportunity for redundancy so you have an icon and you have nomenclature and you know you do all sorts of things to make sure that you reinforce this is the ladies room 
you know, and this is the men's room until the people that are scaring us away from the ERA get their way and convince us all we have to use the same toilet. Um, so those sorts of applications for design are often the first time someone's ever heard about it is when you're sitting at the table or you're in a studio at school or you're working someplace and they go, I never thought of that. And that's really the brilliance of what we do because one more snowflake shown up. And so we, we really get to broaden our scope and recognize if you can't see color, or if you only see certain spectrum of color, what do you do? That's fun. That's why I use the word challenge. I, I just find that creative challenge is fun. You're gonna have a lot of work to do, by the way, because certainly in the spectrum of this nonsense, a 2D world where sadly, I don't think most websites really have considered you. So there's plenty you can do. And the best thing is to be your own advocate. And you know, if this is where you, you contact companies and say, did you know when I look at your screen, this is what I see? Because they don't know it. So now they're edified, next thing you know, you're working. It's a great future. I envy you. My daddy was colorblind. And um, so we numbered and lettered all of his clothing so he could put things together. And I've already forgotten what Sears called that for their children's clothing. Someone told me earlier, granimals or something, yeah. So my father was so vain, he was mortified to think that he wasn't wearing matchy-matchy. And you know, so this, this um, system really helped him if one of his daughters or his wife wasn't home to help him get dressed. Yes. Is she wearing a horrible lifeline around her neck? Because she should have at least that. She should have some medical alert device on her person at all times in case she suffers a fall. Um, the odds are that that is what will be the precursor to her most major health emergency. She's going to fall someday, and, um, and then there'll be a hospitalization. And she might recover from that, and she might not. But um, falls at that age are, are typically a challenge to continuation of life. And it's, and it's one of the hardest things for me to see, just realizing someone was just trying to walk down to their cellar and do a load of laundry, and they, they suffer a fall. Um, I think my mother died as a result of a fall. She was in the care of my sister, and I won't no, because we did an autopsy, my mother, but I'm pretty sure she had a slow bleed in her brain after she fell. And so she was, she was gone within a week. But then I look at the, the bright side knowing she wouldn't have wanted to linger, so that's a good thing. So you want to at least have a medical alert device that's the lowest level of technology for independent living that we should allow as loving family members. Is she in an urban setting or, or a rural setting? Okay, so she has nearby neighbors, or is there quite a distance between homes? Yeah, so the mail carrier should be alerted, and probably already is, and odds are she has a fairly constant mail carrier. I'm dreading the end of snail mail, because mail carriers are the first line of defense to know that something's wrong in a household. When they see in a household, they know where there's an elder living, a pile up of mail or newspapers at the, at the front door, they call the police and they do a welfare check. And odds are there's been a fall. Um, so you wanna make sure that the local 
um, post office is aware that she's alone. Um, I'm torn, I have to tell you, about whether she needs Siri and Alexa. I really am torn. I don't have it. I live in a stupid house. In fact, my agent wants me to write about it, you know, because part of my recovery was not assisted by the fact that I live in a stupid house. Um, because I insisted on getting up and turning on the lights instead of letting Alexa do it. Um, I'm still carrying my Obama Blackberry. I refuse to get an iPhone. <laughs> I'm a lot of trouble. But these are my choices, and they do impact my level of control. And I'm aware of it, I understand it. I'll be less snarky about it the older I get and the more I have need, but right now I'm getting away with it. Have you talked to her about what she thinks? She doesn't need anything, right? Yeah. <laughs> I've met this woman. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, and, and so she's asserting her individuality. She's saying, I'm fine, you know, I love you, go away. Um, but that's not a, an answer that's accurate. Is she part of a church or a religious community of any kind? Um, she, uh, I'm sorry? Loosely. Yeah, because oftentimes that's a wonderful support both for socialization and you know getting someone out on a weekly basis, someone you know in the parish or whatever comes by, picks her up, goes to services, then they maybe go out for brunch and get some pancakes, and then maybe they do some grocery shopping, and so you get another pair of eyes and hands assisting her, and she's not um, confronted by someone insisting that she's being cared for. I think she has every right to be, you know, really snarky and adamant that she's fine. But we, we lovingly do have to insert ourselves. And so those are the basics that I would definitely do. Um, just making sure people are seeing her at least on a weekly basis so that you have eyes and ears that can assist with things. As an anthropologist, I, I garbage dig. It's not ethical, but it's moral. So when I'm invited into someone's household, I excuse myself and I go through the little basket tissue thingy in the bathroom and I look at what has been thrown away. I look for blood on tissues, I look for pill bottles, I look for evidence, forensic evidence that someone's in more trouble than they're willing to admit. I deliberately try and throw um, a napkin away in the garbage and I'm quickly looking at what's in the garbage and if all I see are Chips Ahoy boxes, I know we have a problem. And then I try and find out where the medical supply is and are people taking their, their medications as they should be. Dear God in heaven, I didn't take my blood pressure pill today. That's the three hour time difference. I miss my, I gotta take that as soon as we finish. Someone try and remind me. Um, I mean that seriously, I forgot to take it, not good. Um, yeah, so, Sometimes you just have to be insistent, and definitely at that age you have to be insistent. Because it was heartbreaking when we finally had to say to our mother when her dog died, when her boxer died, her, her barking when the doorbell dog died, because she didn't hear the doorbell anymore, that's when she had to move in with my sister. I think that hastened her end, because she wasn't happy living with my brother-in-law. That's just the truth of it. So I think we have to maintain our, our choice over the quality of our lives. And sometimes that makes people disappointed in what we choose. Thank you so much. Thank you for being such a loving grandson. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go take care of your grandma. Thank you. <laughs>